into three main categories. You have your lip grip ones that just attach to the bottom jaw of the fish, carries them down and either pops open due to you know pressure or there's also some mechanical release ones where you kind of jerk the rod up and it opens the clamp. Um, then there's inverted hook styles, which is exactly what it sounds like, an inverted barbless hook that you, in combination with a weight, carries the fish down and when you reel back in, it slides right out of their mouth like a skewer. Um, and then there's some weighted crates. Uh, people have used crab traps with like chains around them or milk crates with dive weights. I don't see them used as commonly, uh, but those are the three main options. The, the most popular one is probably the sequelizer, which you can set the depth on. They make a shallow water standard version and a deep water. Um, you just simply set the depth, clip it on the lower jaw, and drop them down. And as soon as it hits that depth, it releases. My name is Nick Haddad with Returnum Right, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. Nick, how you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you, Tom? I'm doing great. I'm I'm really happy to have you on here. I think what you're doing is really cool. I'm anxious to learn a lot more about it. Um, return them right. Tell me about that. Yes. So, return them right is a really cool program. It's a new program um, that uh, works with anglers to reduce discard mortality from barrow trauma in reef fish offshore. Um, so, a lot of us go offshore fishing. We have a great day. We catch a fish that's either out of season too small we met our bag limit we let it go and we see it float off on the surface and get eaten by a shark or a dolphin and it's an unpleasant sight and you know there's ways that we can reduce that or prevent that from happening and it's uh it helps the, the anglers out and it also helps the resource out so that's How what do, we're here to do well that's obviously a really big problem in the keys we i see it you know, with all different kinds of fish, but really with the red snapper, like you're out there mutton snapper fishing, mm-hmm. and then the red snappers have been very prolific. You know, we we, we have a lot more of them. It, at one point, it was not a problem at all. I mean, you rarely, yeah. they were rarely ever getting caught, and I don't know what happened, but there's a lot more of them now. And you can't keep them for most of the time, and they're very, you know, difficult to release, I guess, sometimes for a lot of people. And so, you know, I mean, the, the ethical and moral thing to do is to you know if you, if that's what you're catching and it's not in season you need to move on right but not yeah. everybody not everybody operates that way they might be this might be their first and only trip down to the florida keys they're catching these fish they want to keep going it is possible to release them with different devices and and i guess that's what that's what you're doing how did this uh how did this all start for you to to get this program going and where did it come from So this program is actually comes from um, funding from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Mm -hmm. So the program was is actually in the works for a long time, and it's designed to restore fish impacted from that spill. Okay, and and it's now it's everywhere. I mean that that program obviously the Deepwater Horizon was in Louisiana, um, and then but your this program is is um, all over the place, right? So. How does how does that start? Is it was it designed so to the be pro- a Louisiana, you know, Louisiana funded studies and Louisiana funded programs and then this one just happens to be something that is is applicable in a lot of other places or, or how does it work? So the the program's designed to be Gulf of Mexico focused. So a cool component of our project is in addition to providing education, we actually provide free release gear to anglers to use on the water. So we want to provide not just the knowledge, but the tools to actually, you know, go out there and successfully release reef fish. But, you know, with the Atlantic having a two day red snapper season, you know, and a good year, sometimes there's a lot of spillover. A lot of people travel to the Gulf of Mexico to fish. So it's still a Gulf of Mexico focused program, um, but you know the free gear spills over to the South Atlantic a bit, and the education is really relevant everywhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, barrow trauma and discard mortality is not just a local problem; it's a global issue. So um, education is available to everyone. The resources for the for the free gear are limited to anglers that fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about that the, the education a, a bit because you know on this podcast we have lots of inshore fishermen, lots of freshwater fishermen, lots of yep. people that aren't really familiar with, with barrow trauma. And can you tell, tell them what it is and how it happens and, and w- what the solution is? I, I can. Yeah. So <laughs> barrow trauma is, <laughs> probably talk about this all the time. <laughs> I've done it once or twice before. Okay. <laughs> so barrow trauma is a pressure related injury that fish experience when you reel them up from deep water. 
Um, what happens is the pressure change um, actually causes the gases in their body to expand and they blow up almost like a balloon. And this typically happens in depths of 50, 60 feet or more, but it can happen shallower for some species. For example, hogfish, uh, I'm here off the Tampa Bay area. A lot of people fish for hogfish and, you know, 40 feet of water and they can experience barotrauma at shallower, uh, shallower depths. Um, so really there's two main solutions when this happens. You have one is to release that gas so that they can overcome the buoyancy and swim down on their own. And you do that with a venting tool. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, you're using a hollow needle and putting it into a fish. So you have to be careful how you do it, where you do it. Um, so there's a little bit more room for air or there's the use of descending devices, which actually carry the fish back down to depth. It allows them to recompress naturally. So the exact same thing that's happening on the way up is just happening in reverse on the way down. You release them at depth and they're free to swim off on their own. Um, both do work very well when done properly. Uh, but venting, you know, putting a needle in a fish, you know, having to know the anatomy, uh, having to make sure all the air comes out, you're introducing the uh, option or the potential for infection by putting a hole in, in the fish's side. Um, there's just a little bit more room for air. I, in my opinion, it's very important for anglers to know how to do both, to carry both on the boat with them and do what works best for them in a given situation. Hmm. That's interesting. So wonder why it is that some fish are, are more prone to it. Like you mentioned the hog snapper, and then you take another fish like a swordfish that can obviously go from much, much, much deeper to the surface and, and have zero problem. Do you know anything about that? Like why is it that certain ones are more prone to it? Yeah, part of it's the anatomy of the fish. So physoclistus fish don't have like a connection between their air gut um, and their swim bladder. So they can't self-regulate that air quite as well uh, when they come up to the surface. But really, it's just, I mean, even within certain species like red snapper, red grouper, gag grouper, even they have different depths where they seem to be able to get back down fine. So it's just, I think it's just the nature of the beast that some can handle the pressure change different than others can. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you know what, um, at, at one point there was a legal, like they made it a, a rule that you had to have like a venting tool or you had to have a descending device. I don't know. Do you know what the, what the rule is in the Gulf of Mexico and where, what, what you have to have on the boat? Yeah, the, the current rule is the, called the Descend Act, and it actually went into effect January 13th of last year, and it requires anglers who are fishing for reef fish um, to either carry a venting tool or a descending device rigged and ready to use. So it's not you're not required to carry both or one or the other, but you do have to have at least one tool to mitigate the effects of barotrauma with you um, when you're fishing for reef fish. So that could be any sort of And that's of federal waters. In federal waters. Yeah, that's yeah. tricky to know exactly which are, what are federal waters and what are not. So as far as the education goes, do you find that, that a lot of anglers don't know about that, that act and don't know that they're supposed to, by law, have, have these devices on the boat with them? Yeah, so in the Atlantic, it was required descending only at, in, back in 2020, and I found a lot of people still, I mean, we're almost three years later, um, and a lot of people still do not re, are, not, are unaware that that's a regulation. Mm. Um, and the Descend Act, I think the states really pushed out the messaging, so I think people are more a little bit more aware of the Descend Act being only a year into it um, than maybe, you know, the South Atlantic side, but just because they're aware of the Descend Act doesn't mean they're aware of descending devices. We actually, through this project, did a survey last end of last year, and only 32% of anglers in the whole Gulf of Mexico that fish for reef fish were aware of descending devices. So that's, I mean, that's a great mechanism to improve survival. It's probably the safest mechanism for the angler and the fish to reduce discard mortality, and only a quarter of anglers who fish for those species were even aware of it. Hmm. And, you know, you can't do that option if you don't know it exists. Right. And um, with all the, I mean, you got a, a really cool um, Instagram, like the the Return Them Right Instagram, all the different videos of, of fish descending and then then coming off of the device and swimming away, like they're they're perfectly fine. <laughs> Which I think that's one of the most interesting, bar <coughs> excuse me, parts about this is that you can you can actually put a GoPro on a line now and and send it down and see what's happening. And you know before before GoPro, it, you would, this would be a real kind of mystery because you're going down deep enough to where it might be difficult to put a diver down there. I don't know. It's a long way down in, yep. a, in a lot of places. And, and, you know, does this work? 
but your videos are showing without a shadow of a doubt that that it's working do you have any idea what the mortality rates are on have you tagged any fish and then descended and do you have any kind of data on on that at all other than the videos yeah yeah so there's a lot of published research already and our project is actually funding four new studies to do the same exact thing to do to tag fish we're actually working with captains and charter captains to release fish with uh go fish camera so you can actually look at to see if there's any depredation with dolphins or sharks um, so we have four studies in the works right now just through our project that aren't wrapped up yet but um Previous research, for example, um, Brendan Rund, with the uh, he's with the Nature Conservancy now, I believe. He used to be with NC State. Um, he did a, a, a couple, well, actually a bunch of great studies on barotrauma and the use of descending devices. And he found the survival was 87% wow. for red snapper in the, in the off of North Carolina using a descending device. Now, that's a lot better than the 28.5% discard mortality rate the council uses. So in theory, you know, if you can cut that mortality rate in half, then you're, that's, you know, that many more fish you get to keep. Right. So it's, you know, th there's, there's quite a bit of research that supports um, greatly improved uh, uh, su uh, success and survival through venting and descending uh, or doing one or the other. The issue, though, is a lot of these studies with venting, you have scientists who are trained that know exactly how to vent, know exactly what to do. You know, they're the ones doing the doing the research, doing the study when in an environment where you're dealing with four million recreational anglers, not all of them are going to have that same precision with a venting tool. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's a lot of research. And actually on our website, we have a, a resources page that highlights a bunch of different scientific publications. And we just pull a couple facts out of them that might be interesting to people. Wow. So going back to the uh, to the beginning of this program. Did you start the program or did, did you just, what's your history with, with this? So I was brought on, um, uh, in the first year as to Florida Sea Grant as a communications manager, a hundred percent of the time on this project. So when I came into this project, there was no return them right brand. You know, we work with different partners, but we were, our, our goal was to develop this angler driven brand that was kind of independent of any other organization, something that could kind of live on its own and be uh, what we like to say is guided by anglers, but grounded in science. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of part of the early, like the actual branding came on after I was brought onto the project, but the project, uh, you know, the project outline and the project, uh, different partners involved and, and what we were going to do was, or, or anticipated to do was uh, set into place before I got brought on. And what's your, what's your uh, background, like education or, or, what what how how do you I, I guess what I'm asking in a roundabout way is how do you end up running a program like this like it's kind of I don't know it's either it's either like a dream come true for a, for a research st student or or uh, I don't know I don't know how you end up there. It's it's kind of a hybrid. So I I grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm an absolutely avid fisherman. Uh, I probably fish at least 200 days of the year still. Nice. Um, and I was going to do engineering and my mom was like, you know what, you've, you know, you love fishing. You need to do something with fishing. So I came down to Tampa. I studied marine biology. Um, around my senior year, I realized that marine bio biology wasn't really a job and I had to <laughs> focus in a specific aspect of that. Um, so I decided to go to LSU. I got my master's in fisheries and aquaculture management. So I'm kind of a, one of the you know, more unique people that I, I have the science background and the biology and the fisheries management background, but I'm really just a fisherman. So I take everything from the fisherman's perspective. Um, and then I worked for IGFA doing all the fishing uh, records and the angler recognition programs, the grand slams and trophy clubs. Really? And, you know, I'm, I'm an, yeah, so that's what I did before this. And then I kind of took this job to take some of that you know, recreational fishing side of things into the science world more. That's cool. How did, how long were you with IGFA? About two years. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, uh, did you like that? I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I think that, uh, I, that's, that's like, I don't know. I mean, I, I've submitted a couple of records and did that grand slam thing. I just think it's a good organization that's got, I don't know. I mean, world records like that, that's super cool. It, that it was it was one of the coolest jobs i mean I, I i can't lie every day i got to speak with a an angler from somewhere else in the 
the con or somewhere else in the world. I mean, I was working with the director of the Japan Game Fish Association, Australia, working with people from all over the world every day. So you really, the coolest part was the people you got to meet and the stories you got to hear. Because you know, as fishermen, we love talking about vision. So <laughs> yeah. it was, it was an, it was a great job, and um, I got to start to do more like social media and more comms work. So that's kind of what also helped me, you know, take on a comms role, even though I have no traditional training in communications right. uh, or marketing, but I, I kind of started to do more of that. And then you move away from what, what has you move away from the IGFA, a, a different opportunity or like, what, what was it that, that had you move away? Just this opportunity that kind of gives me the chance to use my background a little bit more in uh -huh. fisheries management. And my, my, my passion has always been connecting like the everyday angler with the science. I mm -hmm. think the more fishermen can be involved in science, the better it is for the resource, the more trust we can have between scientists and fishermen, you know, it's just better for the whole process. So that's, it kind of got a chance to use my background and my passion a little bit more to support the resource in this role. What do you think the, the status of, like you mentioned, trust between fishermen and scientists what do you think where do you think that is currently do you th I, mean, I think it's getting a, yeah it's it's tough and it varies by the sector um but there's still a huge gap we have a long long way to come in my opinion um and it's you know there's issues on the recreational side there's also issues on the science and management side of you know things are confusing like i have a i have a master's in in, in fisheries management and you go to these council meetings and it's hard for me to even follow. So how is someone without that background, just an and, everyday fisherman going to follow that process? Right. And so the process that you're talking about, like what, what is hard for somebody like you to follow? Like how, like, um, I mean, I can think of plenty of things that are hard for me to follow, <laughs> but, uh, when you're, when you're referencing something like that, like what, what specifically are, are you would, would confuse you? Well, you know, first of all, when you go to, you know, there's a two page initial document with acronyms that you have to <laughs> learn to understand what they're even talking about. But then you have, you know, your different catch limits, your different catch targets, your allocations, how dead discards incorporate really the stock assessment process is what's the most difficult to understand. And that's the most important because it kind of determines everything. All the science goes into the stock assessment process, which goes into management decisions. So it's not just, you know, someone going out there co to collect data or, on, or reproductive studies or discard mortality. That's like a tiny piece of the whole pie or the bigger picture. Right. And that's, I mean... All of that, when you just think about that as a recreational fisherman or or a professional fishing guide, that's pretty confusing. Like to think about all of that, but yet, you know, recently we've had like the Goliath Grouper open for for mm -hmm. catch, and I had a couple of people on the podcast talking about that, which I thought was really interesting because one of the things that I had not really taken into account, as far as like you know, when you're going out there. As, a, as an angler or a guide or a diver or somebody, it's obvious that there are so many Goliath groupers out there. And it's like, well, why hasn't yep. this opened before? And it was explained to me, well, because there was no, there was no catch data. There's no, there's no yeah. data on this. <laughs> and so I really thought that that, yeah. was a real, that was a real win for all of us, for there to be any sort of experimental season on the Goliath grouper because I think the scientists are saying, okay, well, it seems like there is enough here and let's open this little experimental season, even though we don't have the catch data. And I, I just think that, you know, when that first started, people are like, well, it should be way more than 200. And then the scientists are like, maybe, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it, I just found, I thought that it was, I thought it was a pretty good move um, from the science community and the law enforcement community to open that without the catch data that might be required for to change a to change a limit or to change a season um, for for other fish, right? It just didn't exist because the Goliath grouper has been closed for so long. Um, which I guess you know with, with with this conversation, the Goliath grouper is also a fish that that has trauma, right and that's one that you yeah you have to use a descending device on often 
That's a tough one. That's a tough one because if you catch a 200 pound, how much weight are you using to descend a 200 pound right. Goliath? Or even benting, benting them is very tough too. With their skin is so thick. Well, I mean, you've got a regular um, so horse that, needle like that would that, that yeah. on any kind of snapper would be. You could push it all the way through the whole snapper, right? But yeah, not not it doesn't even it doesn't even hit the cavity on a on a Goliath grouper. You yeah. need something much bigger, I guess. What what? Let's talk about that for a second. Like when you do catch um, the the Goliath grouper, um, something big like that. Um, what what's the what's the protocol? How much weight do you need? What so, device works the best? I don't know. So the best practice for those bigger species is still being studied. So I'm I'm actually part of a on an advisory panel for a project right now that's ongoing specifically for Goliath grouper. You know now make more people may be targeting them. Um, as to what are those best release practices? Is it better to have a descending device and use your anchor to lower them down? <laughs> Is it better to have, I've seen people do it. Sometimes you need a lot of weight to get those things down. Is it better to, um, is it better to have a big venting tool on board? And what this really, you know, my advice is still ongoing, the research for this, but what my advice to the group was, you know, you got to look at this in two ways. There's people targeting Goliath grouper that, you know, they might be able to bring extra weight. They might be able to bring a cinder block or something to descend a fish with. But then you have a lot of people that are reef fishing that may accidentally catch one. And now what do they have on board to bring that fish down? So we're, you know, we're still looking at practical solutions to have to, you know, to that best practice to help these fish survive release. Um, So thankfully the slot limit is smaller. So I think a lot of these fish will be targeted in shallower depths where, you know, for the, for, you know, for harvest, for the people who get that permit, but you know, you have a lot of people going deep. Yeah, you have a lot of people targeting them as, you know, it's cool to catch a 500-pound fish. Well, it is to cool to people. catch a 500-pound fish, but, <laughs> but whether whether you want to or not, I mean, you can catch one when you're yellowtailing. Like, uh, you can catch them yeah. anytime, right? And it doesn't have to be deep. Yeah. And, and they can actually, you could hook one shallow, and they could take you very deep, and then you're pulling it up, yeah. and maybe they, you have barotrauma there. But, it, you know, the one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about using your anchor is a lot of people are anchored up. And so now they catch yeah. this fish. So then what? Like now you're going to have to pull your anchor. And how are you pulling your anchor in in really, you know, like you 400 feet of anchor line out and you're going to need to use an anchor ball and you got this Goliath grouper. That seems more more difficult than uh, than maybe just like, oh, we'll just use your anchor. <laughs> you got to have a yeah. second anchor Thank prepared. <laughs> Thankfully for spot lock, that that option does exist sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, I totally get what you're saying, and honestly, right now the best practice is if people do want to target them, probably don't target them deeper. But again, like you said, it just happens as bycatch. You know, they're they're all over a lot of the wrecks and reefs in uh, South Florida, and even you know up through our area here in Tampa. I was I was on my paddleboard. Um, last end of last year i fish and spear fish for my paddleboard and i dove in in 10 feet of water and was swimming next to a 200 pounder mm-hmm. in 10 feet of water here right off the seagull seagrass flats so yeah. they're, they're everywhere and they also like to eat things everything basically that gets hooked so yeah they eat, they eat it's everything. tough they eat everything but for the purposes yeah. of this conversation it's the ones that that you get in the deep water and you pull them up and uh and then they get the barotrauma um that's that's yeah. really tough let's talk about the actual devices um so you don't you don't have a device like return them right doesn't have a device that you're nope. selling so how do you how do you well, well there's a lot of different kinds of advi- devices out there it's homemade ones commercially produced ones yep. uh different styles different ideas of how to how to do this all for the same kind of thing you're trying to take a fish back down to depth and release them properly so tell me about the the ones that you've seen the different styles the different um uh types of devices and and which ones that you've seen work work the best like if somebody's looking for one of these like what 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 do they look for yeah so there's a variety of styles um there's which we lump into three main categories. You have your lip grip ones that just attach to the bottom jaw of the fish, carries them down and either pops open due to, you know, pressure, or there's also some mechanical release ones where you kind of jerk the rod up and it opens the clamp. Um, Then there's inverted hook styles, which is 
exactly what it sounds like, an inverted barbless hook that you, in combination with a weight, carries the fish down. And when you reel back in, it slides right out of their mouth like a skewer. Um, and then there's some weighted crates. Uh, people have used crab traps with like chains around them or milk crates with dive weights. I don't see them used as commonly, uh, but those are the three main options. The, the most popular one is probably the sequelizer, which you can set the depth on. They make a shallow water standard version and a deep water. Um, you just simply set the depth, clip it on the lower jaw, and drop them down. And as soon as it hits that depth, it releases. Um, you have the fish saver, Captain Roy's fish saver. So this was actually invented, this inverted hook style by... Um, they invented this because they uh, they were dealing with this issue and they didn't know they didn't want to see floaters. None of us want to see fish float off, but they were out of season, so they they actually got fined because they kept some because they didn't want to waste them. Mm -hmm. They got fined, I think, by FWC. They shared the story with us because they, they're like, I don't want to see them float off and die, and that led them to invent a fish saver, which is a great one. Um, there's a Shelton fish descender, so there's a lot of different styles commercially available. But like you said, you can make them at home yourself. So there's there's really no excuse. You can't use it cost too much as an excuse because you can bend a wire and, and use a weight for less pull, than ten bucks. Pull, and I know if you're offshore fishing. Can you can you pull one of those out and show it to the camera? Yeah. Like that. Yeah, so th this is the Ro this is the Roy's fish saver. It's kind of a bigger inverted hook style and it has a tuna clip on it. Um, and you simply put a weight on the one end and then it carries the fish down and it, you just reel up and it slides right out. Right here, you have the sequelizer device, which looks just like a boga grip. Mm -hmm. uh, you clamp the jaws on the bottom, pop them open like that, and you set the depth on the back by aligning the split ring with the screw head, pushing and turning, and it, you can adjust it. And then this is the Shelton Fish Descender. This one's popular more in California for rockfish. It's a little smaller, as you can see, so if you tried to use this on bigger snapper or grouper, it might be a little bit more challenging. Uh, but those are three of probably the more commonly known or more commonly commercial of commercially available devices. Um, this is also another one. This is a seal aider. Um, and it's just simply a, an inverted hook that flips on its own. So you lower it down and it sends the fish down based on the buoyancy on the water. And then you reel in and it slides right out. So there's, there's a lots of different devices and, and, you know, we're not, we promote the use of them and we try to teach people how to use them properly uh, how to make it an easy part of the fishing experience. That's a big thing I'm working on right now, specifically. Um, we're doing well to overcome that awareness gap, but now how do we make it easier on anglers? Because really we want this to be a positive part of your fishing experience. And the easier it is, the, the more positive it'll be and the more time you'll get to spend fishing and the less time you'll have to spend worrying about how to get these fish back down. Right. I mean, well, I don't think anybody wants to see, you know, a, a line of red snappers floating nope. behind their boat. Like it's, it's bad. And if that continues, my, my thought would be, well, what, what would FWC do, um, to, pre to prevent that? Well, they might just close that area or might just close off fishing. Like if you, so I think that, you know, you're, you're trying to save the fish, but it, you're also, yep. or, or anglers should also be thinking, we should really be watching out for our fishing rights here because like if you're not operating you know ethically and eth and legally and you know you're doing it by accident but you're not doing anything about you know you're releasing these fish like you're supposed to but they're all dying well at some point somebody steps in and says look this this can't go on like this. We're going to have to do something. And what would be the most likely thing that they would do is close it down. Nobody wants to see that either. So I think you know you have a you have an obligation as a as an ethical angler to do everything that you can to release a fish that's healthy. But also you got a responsibility to your community that you need to be operating you know in a way that it's obviously not. A, a detriment to to your community like of of anglers right yeah have, well, have, have you ever the, seen, go ahead look at the south atlantic you know there's discussions of closing the whole bottom to fishing for part of the year you know i don't think that's gone through but that was a discussion and that's why, you know we don't want to see that why, anywhere why why would that be even a discussion in the south atlantic because there's so many dead discards okay. that you know when like that you know, what do we do? How, like, how do we overcome this dead right. discards? So issue? I wasn't, I wasn't aware of down that. The, the fishing. Yeah. I wasn't aware that, yeah, that, 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 that I that's mean, something that's even being considered, but that was my first, 
you know, when I was kind of preparing for this podcast, I was just thinking about it and I was like, you know, that's something that really could happen. You know, that, that you could just, yeah. they, they say, well, we can't seem to um, do anything about this. It's happening accidentally, but the only thing that we can do about it is just to close this whole area or to close this, this season, which nobody wants that. I don't even think the FWC no. wants that, right? Like nobody wants that. No. But if that's the only, if that's the only um, solution, then I guess you have to, but it's not. If you, if you learn how to use these descending devices and if we can get the descending devices into the hands of way more anglers than, than have them right now, um, because you're saying, yeah. you know, it was, it was roughly a quarter of the anglers that are fishing in the Gulf of Mexico have them and know about them and know how to use them. A third were even aware of them. So that's not, that didn't mean they use them. I think less than half of them use them. So you're talking about a lot less than like less than a quarter that even use them. Um, so, but what, based on what you said, like you make a great point. And the way I see it is that using these devices is kind of like our insurance policy. You know, we can't control the red tide fully, you know, you know, there's chemical pollution, you know, stuff getting dumped in the water, which doesn't help, but we can't control red tide. We can't control changing ocean patterns, food availability, wind, current, you know, sea surface temperatures to an extent, there's all these things affecting our fishery that we have no control over. The one thing as anglers that we have control over is what happens to that fish after we release it. Not everyone's going to survive. No one's, no one's ever going to say that, but what, what you do have control over is, you know, giving that fish its best chance to survive release. And it's an insurance policy because really, you know, something goes wrong somewhere else, you know, that helps us, you know, we're, we're, at least we're doing our part to make sure we're ma- keeping the fishery as healthy as possible. Right. Now, um, with the funding that comes from this, from the Deepwater Horizon, you're able to just um, buy these commercially available products. And then like you go right to your website, and one of the first things you see is get, get free gear. Right. So how yep. does, how does that work and, and which devices do you choose and how does, I don't know, maybe somebody out there has got a device that works better than anything that you, we've seen before and they want to get in touch with you. I don't know. Uh, yep. or anglers just want, you know, okay, well I'll take a free one. Um, so how, do, what, how does that whole program work? Yeah. So we spent a lot of time discussing the package, which I have right here. This is what you get to your front door after you uh, complete our online education module, which only takes about 15 minutes. Um, so we spent a lot of time discussing, you know, what gear we wanted to, you know, procure, how we, what we wanted to ship, what that package would look like. And we had an open invitation to bid process through the University of Florida. So any manufacturers could could bid on this project and if like you said if anyone does you know want to get involved i encourage them to reach out to us because we're not exclusive to any company Um, and then from different effectiveness studies so we looked at effectiveness studies user air you know you know what anglers preferred from there we awarded contracts to three different manufacturers Um, actually the only three that bid on the project these three that i'm showing you right now Um, so we awarded contracts to all of them so that we try to promote them all um, now, the package we have right now, it includes, it's actually a package you can't get commercially. It actually includes a sequelizer pre-rigged to a weight uh, really? via a three-way swivel and a loop knot. So you Dang. get this whole package here and pays, you get a second inverted. <laughs> Who pays the shipping on that? that yeah. seems, <laughs> it seems like the weight, the weight <laughs> is expensive. <laughs> So we, we do, and unfortunately shipping costs have doubled in the last year as a lot of things have increased, but you also, you also get an inverted hook descending device. So we send two descending devices and a weight to make it happen. So it's really as easy as can be. Um, this weight is looped on as well. So I tell people, you know, if you're catching more undersized loop on and put a smaller weight, you might not need three pounds, but this will get from my personal experience, this will get like a 15, 16 pound snapper down. So pretty good sized fish. Okay. And you know, you, you'd rather have more weight than not enough and, and the, the fish still be floating. Now, is it possible to take them down too quickly? From most of the research that's out there, the, the answer is currently no. It seems like they do okay going down pretty quick. Um, and given the state of, you know, sharks and dolphins, I think getting them to the bottom closer to their habitat quicker is actually a good thing. Um, but it is a question that's, that's asked frequently, like, cause you know, as divers, you come up slowly and adjust. Right. Um, but 
but no, it's the, based on the current research and evidence. It's, you know, get them to the bottom as quickly as possible and, and get them released and get them back to where they can actually, you know, find protection from the school or get back under, you know, the structure you caught them from. Mm-hmm. And when you're using the sequelizer and you're actually having to set a depth, how do you, how do you instruct people to use that? So I tell people to set it and, you know, have your setup rig before you even drop a first bait down. So if you're fishing in 170, set it to 150. I always tell people as close to the bottom as possible. So the, the, the science is kind of varied, but it usually says a third to a half the capture depth is how far you want to get them so that they can actually recompress enough to the point where they can swim back down. But again, I prefer to get fish as close to the bottom as possible because, you know, that's you don't want them swimming past predators any more than they have to, especially after they just fought their whole way up. You know, they right. don't have all the energy they had that they had, uh, you know, 10 minutes prior. Yeah, that's a good th- that's a good thing. So you're like 20 feet off the bottom in whatever depth you're you're. Well, I mean, if it's like you said, 170, put it at 150. So if you're at 200, yeah. you put it at like 180 or something or. Well, 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 that's the thing with the sequelizer. That's the one downside is you have increments. So you have set oh. increments. So the standard one, you can only set to 50 feet, 100 feet, or 150 feet. Now they make a deep water version that's 100, 200, or 300 feet. And there's a shallow water, 30, 60, 90. Um, so again, it's close to the bottom, you know, so if you're 190, then I still have to do 150. But if you have a deep water one and you go to 210, then do 200. So, you know, as close to the bottom as possible is, is what's best. Um, in my opinion, you know, the science may say halfway is all you need, but again, I'm very aware, very well aware of the current state of predators and, uh, yeah. that we deal with on a normal basis. So I think getting them, getting them down close to the bottom is best. Wow. So how long do you, uh, do you expect that the, the funding will last on this project to, to be able to continue to do what you're, what you're doing? Do you have any forecast on that or? Yeah, I can estimate. Um, it depends on, you know, how costs go up. If we change the package at all, you know, the, if we reduce the value, if we take the weights out and shipping's, <laughs> shipping's less expensive, then we could probably give out more devices. Um, but since we launched May 3rd last year, and it's been a pretty incredible response. As of today, we've had 12,400 anglers who fish offshore complete our module and we've shipped them all gear. So that's 12,400 more people with gear in their hands aware of the issue. Uh, made sure that we make sure that they go through the training first. We're not just giving gear to anyone. Um, and we're looking at from a gear perspective, you know, somewhere around, you know, maybe 40, 50,000 packages. So maybe the next couple of years, depending on the demands, you know, we can't really say for sure how quickly they'll go. Um, but since May we d- of last year, we did a little bit over 12,000 packages. Wow. That's really good. Um, is that, yeah. did you expect more, less? Did you have any expectations whatsoever? <laughs> well we uh we had quite a successful launch that first month i think we gave out like i think we did the first week i think we did two or three thousand packages or something wow. so we had a we had a lot of initial demands you know we had a pre-registration list we had our press release was picked up like 30 times or, or something i think last year we had 65 media mentions so we it, we had a lot of a lot of press and and it led to a very quick launch and we actually scaled it back. It used to be one per angler, three per household max, but we had to to deal with the demand. We had to scale back to one per household uh, or one per shipping address. Um, so you know I think realistically with continued education, outreach, pushing, marketing, we could probably do I think ten thousand a year is realistic. Um, and you know you're looking at forty thousand, you know, around four years or so. Wow, that's really good. And uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do on the, this podcast a little more often is when we talk about these things, instead of waiting till the very end to give all the the important information about the website and how people do things like this, um, tell tell go through the process of where you would go and what this what this education process looks like and and how somebody would actually get one of these devices or all of yeah, the whole it's a, it's a pr- it's as simple as could be. You go to returnemright.org. That's returnemright.org. Uh, you'll see a button right on the home screen that says get free gear. There's some instructions on the little module. Um, you click to begin the module and it starts with a few questions so we can, you know, gauge your role in the fishery, you know, where you fish 
And um, it, immediately up front, we say if you're eligible for gear or not, because again, you know, I encourage anglers, if you're not going to, like, if you're an inshore fisherman, you have no intentions to go offshore, you know, don't say that you fish offshore to get this gear because it's meant to support the resource. Um, but then from there, once you, you have the option to begin, whether you're eligible or not, and it takes about 15 minutes, we have two, two slides on just general best practices. So how to be prepared for your trip. You know, we all make a plan when we're fishing, but a lot of us don't really think about the plan for releasing fish or what species we're going to catch, what bycatch we're going to encounter. It's very frustrating when, you know, anglers go offshore and there's a fish flopping around on the deck for five minutes while they're looking up the rules and regulations, trying to figure out if they can keep it or not. Right. Um, and then, then we go into barrow trauma, venting and descending. So it's, it, the average completion time is 14 minutes. It's really not burdensome at all. Um, a couple cool videos on there and how to vent. Um, I think you, you had a podcast with my colleague, David Moss. He mentioned yes, the did. video from Brendan runs about the, uh, about the red grouper descending. It's an absolutely awesome video. It was caught in 215 feet of water. And since red grouper have that softer body, they really blow up more than red snapper. So you can really see the recompression upon, upon descent. Um, and that fish was actually uh, tra- uh, tagged and tracked for like five months to demonstrate long-term survival, not just, wow. you know, what they saw in the video. Yeah, that's um, cool. And there's also, yeah, so it's really quick. And then at the end, there's a shipping form. Uh, you click click to submit your shipping address, confirm you want the gear. And, you know, within a week or two, depending on the demand, we mail it to your front door. That's cool. And then, so there are other people, like you mentioned, David Moss, uh, Nature Conservancy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, how do you yep. work with them and their, like, other um, organizations or groups that kind of have a similar similar mission to, to get this information and these devices into the hands of people that need to use them. How do you, how do you all work together? Is it a competitive thing? Is it a working together kind of deal? I would imagine it, that it is. It, yeah. It's, you know, we're all doing this for the same common goal. You know, it supports anglers. Like you said, we don't want to lose access in the future and it also supports the future of the fishery. You know, the end goal is just a healthier overall fishery that, you know, we get to utilize as much as possible. So we, you know, we support each other. Uh, David and I had a booth next to each other at ICAST last year. We actually have a Southeast descending device team. You know, we meet with once or, you know, a few times a year just to see what we're going on, see if we can collaborate on anything. Um, so we all support each other. We share resources, really. We try to try to have a common message. Um, so, you know, we're not, you know, leading anglers astray. Obviously, the regulations are a little different in the areas, but uh, yeah, we work together really well. You know, we support each other and we, we try to make this a concerted push and, and try to keep keep everyone involved and, and education out there flowing as much as possible. Yeah. Well, for the purposes of education, there are people out there that, that have purchased these descending devices. They they understand that they're they, they need them. They're fishing in areas where mm-hmm. where they can use them. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was how to be prepared before you go out. So some of these people, they've already got their devices and they're not going to go to your website and they're not going to take this, this deal. So let's go over like what, what, what the best practices are when, when somebody's going to go out reef fishing and, and maybe it's a new area. Maybe they have no idea what they're going to catch. I don't know. What do you, what do you, uh, what, what kind of advice are you giving people? Well, first and foremost, if you're planning on fishing deeper than 30, 40, 50 feet, have a descending device and a venting tool on board, um, you know, and have enough weight to descend fish. So you can use a swivel or a loop knot, but make sure you have like, you know, a, a one, two, three pound weight, have a couple of them in case you need to add weight and you catch a monster, you know, black grouper out of season or something and you need to descend it. So just be prepared, bring what you need to bring t- just in case you run into a situation Um, and then it's really just kind of knowing the signs and the symptoms and the situations where you would have to use those devices. So if you're fishing for, you know, yellow tailing or fishing in shallower depths, like 30 feet, you know, have a D hooker with you and don't even, you know, if the fish isn't displaying signs of barrel trauma, if its eyes aren't bulging, if it's not bloated, if its stomach isn't coming out of its mouth, use a D hooker, just get that fish back in the water as quickly as possible. And as you go deeper, pay attention to the depth, you know, and know when you might experience barrel trauma. So if you're fishing 80 feet, you know, you should know that, you know, a fish you release might float off. So you're going to need to either vent or descend the fish. Um, and, and like I said, being prepared at that depth. So if you're fishing 120, have your device already rigged up, have it set to the right depth and before you begin fishing, because 
you know, it's, it's better to be prepared in advance. Um, but that's really the, the best thing and work quickly. I tell everyone this, uh, whether you're de-hooking, venting or descending, I can't stress enough how important it is to get those fish back in the water quickly. I've vented hundreds of fish. And if you, if you mess around on the surface and they're out of the water too long, uh, they, uh, they, the survival's not as, not as great. Yeah. That's great advice. What and about, on, go ahead. On that, uh, on that, uh, notion, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, that fish is going to swim down eventually. It's almost like them justifying or trying to tell themselves that, you know, they didn't accidentally kill a fish by letting it float off. Mm-hmm. Barotrauma actually gets worse on the surface. So there's uh, the ideal gas law for, for anyone who likes physics out there, PV equals NRT. So volume is actually related to temperature. So if you've ever uh, left your water bottle in your car on a hot day, and then you get back in the car and it's steamy and expanded, so that's the volume increasing to offset the increase in temperature. So the longer a fish sits on the deck, the longer it's floating away on the surface, the barrel trauma is actually getting worse. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so they're, they're not just going to swim down eventually. They're going to get eaten by a shark. No. Or they're just going to float off like that. What about yeah. when? Um, yeah. What about when you get a fish and and the the stomach comes out of the mouth and what do you what do you should you try to push that back in or just just to send them or or is there anything that you should be doing when when that happens? The, you know, like sometimes these fish look like there's no possible way that they would they would be okay. Their eyes are almost popped out of their skull and their and their stomach is out. But from the videos that I've seen, those fish do really well. But I'm just wondering if there's something, should you try to push that stomach back in or like a lot of times, like a lot of times it's like a balloon, you know, and, and I've seen people pop it like, oh, well, that's going to keep them from swimming down. So they pop that stomach. Um, but I don't know what the, what the right thing to do is in that situation. Yeah. You never want to pop that stomach. That's, that's definitely, that's a old misconception is that right. you just, you know, take the hook and pop the stomach. They might go down, but putting a hole in their stomach is not a good idea for that fish. Um, I actually, if you look at our Instagram too, we have a lot of videos and there's a, a few red grouper videos with their stomach sticking out and we descend them. Um, so, so l- l- descending them is the best option. In my opinion, you're letting all those gases recompress naturally. So that stomach will go back into place naturally. Now you can vent the fish um, again, you know, but you don't want to stab the stomach. You still vent behind the pec fin, let the gas escape and throw them back. But when the stomach's coming out like that, I, I, in my opinion, it's the best thing to do is to send them, just clip it on the lower jaw. Or if you're using an inverted hook, you can actually go in the mouth and out, out the soft tissue under the chin so you don't pierce the stomach mm-hmm. um, and just send them down and let that gas recompress so that, that what's filling that stomach up will also recompress. Even the eyeballs, you know, it's all the gases in the body that are expanding on the way up. It's not just the swim bladder that causes the issue. So that's mm-hmm. why you get the bulging eyes as well. So yeah, it's it's pretty cool that uh, that, you know, some... There's some fish that, you know, can have some permanent damages, like in the lens and the eye, if, if it's severe, but those, they, they go back to pretty much normal. Uh, a lot of the time, if you just drop them and get them as close to the bottom as possible, that, that Brendan run video from NC state, I mentioned that thing's eyes were like fully mm-hmm. out of its head yeah. and it lived for five months. Wow. So it's, it, it, it's pretty cool. Um, and that's just, you know, that's a huge misconception that go like videos and GoPros have helped overcome is that that fish is dead. Anyway, a lot of anglers tell me that at fishing clubs and I'm like, well, check out these videos. You know, right. they're not actually dead. If and, you bring and, them back down and tell people where they can see those videos. Yeah. So you can go to, uh, you know, through our education module, we'll show you, show you uh, a couple of videos, but if you go to our YouTube, uh, at return them, right. We have more videos on there. Um, and also follow us on Instagram. I like posting a lot of videos and reels. So I'd send a camera down with almost all the fish we descend. Um, and I like, yeah, so I make a lot of reels and different videos with those. So check out our social media. It's all at return them right. And then YouTube as well. We have quite a few videos. Um, and it's cool to see, it's cool to see the fish like kind of go back to normal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the you know, survival is never going to be a hundred percent, but we can give them a pretty darn good chance. Yeah. And with, uh, with, with all the different species that you're, you're, returning um and and videoing is there one that that just seems to do the very best with it um like you mentioned i don't the red know if grouper i say there's really one. pops really really blows up like a balloon um and then when so when when you send it back down it 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 looks like wow that's a that's a big difference right there but i, I just wondered if there was one that you know always just 
pops off that that uh, device every single time and swims away real strong, or or if you've noticed any any species that does better than others. I don't know if I've noticed the species. So like I mentioned, like the red group are just the softer bodies. They're just naturally going to blow up more like a balloon. The same thing's happening with red snapper, but they're so armored mm-hmm. that, you know, you don't really see the, you don't see them bloat as much. You kind of have to feel their stomach and you'd feel that it's hard. So you don't really see the recompression as much. Um, but I don't think I've really noticed a single species do a lot better on descent or, or worse for that matter. But I will say, I feel like the smaller fish, uh, maybe it's because they didn't fight as hard getting up, or maybe they got up to the, the up to the surface quicker because they were smaller or didn't use as, you know, build up enough lactic acid. But I feel like they really pop off the device and take off like a bullet back to the bottom, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool to see. Yeah. Well, that is, that is, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So when you see it on video, that's, it's encouraging for sure. Um, well, that's mm-hmm. awesome, man. So, uh, do you have any other, um, kind of goals with this program? Are there any other offshoots of this or is it straight up just trying to get these devices in people's hands? Yeah. i like I mentioned before, uh, you know, return them right. Is this like, you know, Florida Sea Grant, we work really heavily on the education and outreach side. There's a whole research and monitoring and evaluation side that I haven't talked much about. Uh, my colleague at the commission actually works on that side. So we're, you know, a partnership in this effort. Um, and you know, he's funding studies, like I mentioned, to address release mortality, to address depredation. And he's also establishing observer programs or reestablishing in Alabama, Mississippi, and, and Florida so that we can actually have observers on the water account for the device use. So this is an all-encompassing project where we're not just looking at getting these in the hands. We're actually looking at collecting the data um, so that they can be incorporated in the stock assessment process. Cause that's the end goal, right? Yeah. You know, we want the resource managers to know that we're doing the right thing. So that's a really, really cool side of the project that most people are probably unaware of is that we're putting a tremendous amount of resource into, you know, the people that do record this, the people that do surveys so that, you know, this can be, uh, this can be recorded. And actually on, on some of the surveys, we have had questions added on venting and descending in hopes that, you know, the stock assessment scientists can incorporate this into future assessments. Where would these observers be like on commercial boats or what, where would, where would an, an observer be? They're typically on charter for hire uh, boats, so either head boats or charter boats. So a lot of the head boats in my area will have observers on mm-hmm. them. Yeah, in tar- in Tampa Bay here. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, cool, man. Well, I I think that uh, what you're doing is is definitely very good. I encourage everybody that fishes offshore to go and and uh, do your surveying, whether they get the free gear or go buy a descending device or make one yourself or do do however. But I do definitely encourage the use of it because it it works and if you doubt that it works go and check out these videos it's really it's really incredible to watch these fish just swim right off uh and and to see what they look like before because they didn't look like they were going to swim off mm-hmm. <laughs> it did not look like they were going to swim off <laughs> absolutely not yeah but uh anyway um thanks for coming on man i appreciate it and uh once again why don't you give everybody the uh the the places to go the social media and everything one more time just just to make sure that everybody got it Yep, returnemright.org uh, for best practices, science, resource, everything involving barotrauma. Email us and any question. I'm happy to talk to you, whether it's about setup or how to make it easier on your boat. Um, info at returnemright.org is our, our email. And then on all of our social media platforms at returnemright, um, message us. You know, we're here to be a resource to anglers. I'm a fisherman. I'll, you know, I'll answer anyone who, who reaches out if it's whether it's about this project or you just want to talk fishing. Yeah, we're here for you. I think they want some of those big black grouper spots. Uh, <laughs> I think you'll get a lot more <laughs> emails. Too. You're going to get a lot more emails <laughs> if you start giving those spots out. But uh, anyway, um, all right, man. Well, Nick, thanks, man. I appreciate what you're doing and uh, and let us know how we can help in the future. Um, but as of now, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's, it's, a, it's a great program. I appreciate talking with you, Tom. Thanks for having us. All right. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week. See you. See you.